The day of choosing has arrived. Queen Penelope has just entered the throne room where all the suitors are assembled. For the past few days, she has been their prisoner. Held captive in the Geneseum, this place reserved for women under the surveillance of the 12 maids who betrayed her. Penelope must now resign herself and choose from among these impertinent suitors the one who will replace Ulysses, whom it is now clear will never return. For 20 years, Penelope has awaited the return of her beloved husband, Ulysses. She has prayed day and night and used different ruses to evade the pressing advances of the suitors. And nothing, not even constraint, could extinguish the hope of one day seeing Ulysses again. But today, Penelope knows she can no longer avoid this odious wedding. However, she will prove her loyalty one final time to the man she has never ceased to love. To decide between the suitors, she has devised a test for them, inspired by the memory of her husband. She walks up to them and presents them with Ulysses' great bow. The suitors have to string this great bow and shoot a single arrow through a line of 12 axe heads. Only Ulysses was capable of such a feat. Penelope will offer herself as a reward to the one who can match the prowess of her late husband. Telemachus is the first to take up the challenge. He wants to prove that he is no longer a child and can protect his mother. If he succeeds, she will not leave this place with a new husband, but will reign over Ithaca with her son, who will drive out the suitors. Three times Telemachus attempts to string the bow, and three times he lacks the strength. A first suitor steps forward and fails in his turn. A second one grabs the bow, warms it in the heat of the fire, and fails. A third one tries, then a fourth, in vain. It is soon Antinous' turn. He starts boasting. The other suitors are no match for him. Let them all witness the strength of the mighty Antinous, future king of Ithaca. Antinous grabs the bow and with all his might attempts to string it. But he too finally has to give up. Preoccupied by their failed efforts, the suitors haven't noticed that the strange vagabond they had bullied the day before has just entered the room. Nor do they notice the sign he makes to Telemachus and the swineherd Eumaeus, who discreetly gathers up all the suitors' weapons. Take them outside to the courtyard to a storage hut and lock them inside it. It's the old servant Heraclea who guides the beggar to the suitors. The beggar offers to try in his turn, explaining that he wants to see if there is anything remaining of his former strength and agility, or if his life of wandering and hardship has destroyed it. 
His words are met with a stream of insults from the suitors. What impertinence! They explode with rage. Let him leave this palace immediately and return to his pigsty with his swineherd friend. But Penelope intervenes. This beggar is a guest of Telemachus, and it is neither courteous nor fair to disrespect the guests of a prince, whoever they might be. Do the young pups who make up this pack of suitors think that this stranger, if he succeeds in stringing Ulysses' bow, would take Penelope away and make her his wife? The poor beggar himself has never imagined such a thing. Let their hearts thus not be saddened by such a thought, and let them continue to eat, drink, and make merry until they finally gain the strength to string the bow of Ulysses. Telemachus approves his mother's decision, but asks her to return to her quarters. It is he who has the authority to give or refuse his father's bow to whomever he pleases, and none of the suitors will be able to stop him. The test of the bow, he adds, is men's business. Old Euryclea then takes an astonished Penelope by the arm and leads her back to her room as Telemachus has ordered. The swineherd Eumaeus, obeying Telemachus's order, takes Ulysses' bow and, amidst insults from the suitors, presents it to the beggar. This latter runs his hands all over it, first one side, then the other. He examines it, he weighs it, he twirls it around, drawing sarcastic remarks and sniggers from the courtiers. Then, effortlessly, he strings the bow and releases it. The brass-tipped arrow whistles through all 12 axe heads without missing a single one. The beggar then throws off his rags, leaps onto the hall's threshold, and the bewildered suitors immediately recognize the king of Ithaca, who all believe dead, Ulysses. Telemachus immediately goes to stand beside his father, the suitors have no time to gather themselves. Ulysses shoots arrows in all directions, and the first one strikes Antinous in the throat. Then Eurymachus, then Amphinomos, then Agelaus, and Pisander. With just two of them against all, their victory, however, seems compromised. The suitors search desperately around them for a shield, a sword, a spear. They discover that the doors leading to the great hall have been locked. Furious, they throw themselves on Ulysses and Telemachus. A bloody clash ensues. Arrows rain down on the suitors. Some beg to be spared, others curse the hero. The Palace of Pleasure soon becomes an execution stage. The party is over for the criminals. They are all slaughtered, without hesitation, without mercy. Father and son, relentless, punish those who for years have ruined their home, slept with their maids, coveted a wife and a mother, with the sole aim of dispossessing them of their kingdom. When the last man has been killed, Ulysses and Telemachus, bloody and dirty, summon Eurycleia, the old nursemaid. Ulysses asks her to name the women of the palace who have betrayed him and those who are innocent. Eurycleia tells him the truth. Of the 50 women who served Penelope, 12 have betrayed him and given themselves to the suitors, precipitating their mistress's ruin. 
Ulysses demands that these 12 maids be brought to him. He orders them to drag the corpses of their lovers out of the courtyard and then to clean the blood-splattered floor. Ulysses tells Telemachus that he must now do his mother justice and make these 12 women forget all memory of the treacherous pleasure they indulged in. Telemachus, with the help of the swineherd, leads the unfaithful maids out of the courtyard. They wail, they sob, they lean against one another for support. Devastated by the fate of their handsome lovers, they hardly pay attention to the sentence proclaimed by the young prince. Let it not be said that he accorded the sweetness of prison to those who insulted his mother and slept with her arrogant enemies. On one of the tall columns surrounding the palace courtyard, Telemachus attaches a ship's cable, then orders the execution. Old Eurycleia gently wakes Penelope. She cannot contain her joy. Ulysses has returned. But Penelope is speechless when she sees the man standing in front of her. He bears a resemblance to Ulysses, certainly, but he has aged so much. His skin is so weathered by the sun and seawater that Penelope cannot be sure that he is indeed the man who shared her bed. She looks at him, but doesn't rush into his arms, doesn't show any emotion. She doubts the identity of this man who is presented to her as being the king of Ithaca, father of Telemachus. She fears that this stranger has come to deceive her with his discourse. There are so many who are evil-minded. So Ulysses, exhausted by the fight he has just waged, disconcerted by Penelope's aloofness, turns to old Eurycleia. With a sigh, he complains about the hardness of Penelope's heart, how she fails to recognize the man who, after an absence of 20 years and great suffering, has finally returned to his homeland. Let his old nursemaid, who for her part knew how to welcome him appropriately, prepare a bed for him so that he may rest at last. Penelope then speaks. She orders Eurycleia to prepare for this man who delivered her from the suitors the bed that Ulysses himself carved, in which has been moved to another room in the palace. Ulysses' face crumples. Then anger overcomes him. Who has dared to move his bed? This could only be done by destroying it. For Ulysses built this bed around an olive tree rooted in the ground. One of the columns was carved from the trunk of the tree precisely in such a way that it could never be moved by anyone. On hearing these words, Penelope's heart misses a beat. Here is the proof that it is indeed Ulysses who has just spoken. For only the two lovers know the secret of this column. She throws herself into his arms, kisses his face, 
begs him to forgive her for having recourse to trickery to verify her husband's identity. Ulysses laughs at her ruse. He who owes his survival to his own cunning disguises and tricks. Night has fallen on Ithaca. From the top of the ramparts, Ulysses gazes out over his city, savoring his newfound plenitude. A voice pulls him out of his reverie. And for the first time in a long time, he sees the goddess Athena in her true appearance helmeted and wearing her gold sandals armed with a spear and shield. The goddess smiles kindly at him. So Ulysses has found his palace, his throne, and his wife Penelope again. Thanks to the gods who have always watched over him, starting with herself as Zeus wished. Let him therefore chase from his mind the seditious ideas that his misfortunes of the past 10 years have planted there. But Ulysses glares at the goddess. Where were the gods beneath the ramparts of Troy when carnage was added to victory? When old Priam's head was cut off, Hector's wife raped, the wounded who begged for mercy slaughtered, the newborns thrown over the walls. Where were the gods when the streets turned into rivers of blood and the sky above the palace was ablaze? The gods were absent. And it is because of their silence that Ulysses today and all mortals tomorrow will turn away from them. And continues Ulysses, if the gods are just, then why is the world a place filled with injustice? No, it was not the gods who helped Ulysses return home. On the contrary, the gods, unjust, petty and cruel, plotted his downfall, and he triumphed over all the trials they put in his way, thanks only to his tenacity and determination. The gods had nothing to do with it. Humanity no longer needs gods such as these. From now on, mortal men need only rely on their wits and intelligence to devise stratagems, as he himself did, and live without fear of incurring the vain wrath of divinities unable to protect or love them. For thousands of years, the gods have played with men's destinies as they play with dice. But Ulysses has freed men from their submission. In front of Athena, on the ramparts of his regained city, Ulysses declares that men, although mere mortals, are no longer pawns on the chessboard of the gods, but sovereign creatures. Zeus and Athena once again confront each other. So Athena's plan has failed. Zeus points this out to her, but without anger. These are the cold facts. Ulysses, her protege, has fooled them. Athena admired his cunning and his lies, his ingenuity. But now, back at home, victorious and rebellious, her protege has concocted the idea that the gods are unjust and no longer deserve to be worshipped. And he is giving this lie the illusion of truth. 
Ulysses is the man who has pitted humanity against the gods. Zeus capitulates. He has understood that Ulysses is leaving them alone, disunited, face to face with their immortality. The gods will survive even if men no longer believe in them, just as the gods of ancient times survived. They will survive alone, discredited, and in the most terrible of ways, eternal, deprived of death, wandering aimlessly amongst the shades. Soon, the shrines dedicated to the Olympian gods are abandoned. The gods are forgotten, and the power of men is celebrated. There are only three very distant deities who continue to rule over human destiny. These are three sisters, known as the Fates. The fates regulate the duration of each existence with a thread, which Atropos, the most relentless and feared of the three, always ends up cutting when the time has come. Even though men have ceased to believe in Zeus and the gods of Olympus, they know that the three sisters determine how much time they will spend on Earth. Men fear the fates as much as they respect them. No one knows exactly what became of the hero of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Poets tell many stories about him. Some say he died a wealthy old man on his island, surrounded by his faithful wife, Penelope, and his son, Telemachus. Others claim that he languished so much at home that he went out to sea and rode the swell again on a sturdy ship. Or that he exiled himself in a distant land to atone for the unnecessary slaughter of the 12 maids committed by his son Telemachus who exceeded his orders. And there, he met a young man who sought quarrel with him. A fight ensued. Only the young man got up. When Ulysses asked him his name, the young man, to honor the warrior he had defeated with great difficulty, replied that his name was Telegonos, son of the sorceress Circe, born from an unknown father. And darkness fell over Ulysses' eyes. While in their distant cave, and where the threads of life are woven, measured, then cut always too short, the three sisters of fate busy at their terrible task, smile sardonically. 